Okay, Panthers. So today we're going to uh, take a look at and try to decide when did the modern civil rights movement begin in the United States? There's lots of different uh, options, lots of different uh, points in, in American history that you can point to in, in the 20th century to say, yep, that's when the 20th, that's when the 20th century modern civil rights movement began. So today, that's our mission to try to determine when did the modern civil rights movement begin in the United States. Did it begin with Martin Luther King, who is probably the most renowned, most uh, well-known civil rights leader of the 20th century. Um, he comes to prominence in the mid-1950s, leading a very successful bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. And um, pushes through ser several civil rights uh, laws and conducts several civil rights campaigns in an, uh, in an effort to get equal voting rights and equal rights in general for African Americans, predominantly, uh, especially in the South, but you know throughout the country. And uh, he's probably best known for giving his I Have a Dream speech on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial be before over 100,000 people in 1963. To begin with W.E.B. Du Bois, who uh, was a civil rights leader late 1800s into the early 1900s, who believed in the talented 10th, that uh, African Americans should get uh, the most talented 10%, the most intelligent, most capable 10% of the African American population should go get a, uh, um, a college education and become doctors and lawyers and engineers and show that they are just as capable of being very good doctors and very good lawyers and very good engineers as are whites. Uh, he was the first African-American to graduate from Harvard University. He actually got a doctorate from Harvard University, and he founds a civil rights organization in 1909, the NAACP, which is still around today, advancing civil rights. To begin with Rosa Parks, who in December of 1954 challenged um, segregation laws in Alabama, in Birmingham, uh, uh, Bur yeah, Birmingham, Alabama, when she refused to give up her seat to a white passenger on a bus. She just said, I'm not going to do that today. And she ended up being arrested, but her arrest actually sparks a, um, a, busing uh, boycott that brings to, uh, Martin Luther King to national prominence as he comes to lead this boycott in uh, the wake of uh, Rosa Parks being arrested. Then to begin in 1960, when a group of uh, North Carolina University students go into a lunch counter in uh, Greensboro, North, uh, North Carolina, and sit at the lunch counter. Now in, in the South, lunch counters are a very big deal. This is the place to sit in diners, which were very popular back in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, particularly in the South. And they love sitting at lunch counters. That is the prime seating. Well, African-Americans were not allowed to sit at the lunch counter. That was reserved for whites only. And in 1960, these four uh, North Carolina, University of North Carolina students went into this Woolworths and sat down at the lunch counter and refused to leave until they were served. And it, um, it, it ignites a nationwide boycott against lunch counters and similar protests begin to take place at segregated lunch counters across the country. To begin at the 1968 Olympic Games, when two American uh, sprinters Tommy Smith and John Carlos, when they're awarded their gold and uh, bronze medals during the playing of the national anthem, instead of co covering their hearts, they raise their fists in the air as a sign of black power, wearing a black leather glove on their fists. They were eventually stripped of their Olympic medals for this protest. Does it begin with them? This is the... Um, a symbol of black power, the black power movement. Does it begin with Booker T. Washington, who uh, founds a, a school 
of higher education specifically for um, black students to teach them skills that they're going to need to be successful in the world, teaching them skills uh, to be very good at jobs that were readily available to them. Remember, he's known as an accommodationist. So he opens the Tuskegee, uh, now known as Tuskegee University, back then it was Tuskegee Institute, to teach African Americans how to be the best carpenters and how to be the best bricklayers and how to be the best um, the, 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 the best uh, field workers that they could be. Does it begin with him opening the first uh, school for higher education for African Americans? Does it begin in the 1970s when there is a push for busing and integrating schools? Schools, uh, Supreme Court had ruled in the 1950s that schools can no longer be segregated. But reality was in the 1970s, schools, many schools, particularly inner city schools were still segregated. There were still white schools and there were still black schools. And so laws are put into place that mandated that half of the population in a white school would be bused across town to the black school. And then half of the students in the black school would be bused across town to the white school to force integration. Does it begin with uh, the integration, uh, the forced integration of schools with busing in the 19, late 1960s into the 1970s? Does it begin with J.D. Shelley in 1948, who uh, in 1948 bought this duplex, bought this house in St. Louis to move his family in, only to find that there were neighborhood covenants, neighborhood rules, which prohibited African Americans from living in the neighborhood? J.D. Shelley sued against these covenants stating that it was uh, it was illegal. It was a violation of his civil rights to uh, determine who and who, who and who could not live in a neighborhood. And the Supreme Court ruled in his favor. Does it begin in 1948 with J.D. Shelley? Does it begin with Ruby Parks, who was a uh, young six-year-old girl in Louisiana who was going to become the first African-American student to attend a white school in uh, New Orleans. And she had death threats against her. And she had to be escorted into and out of the school by US federal uh, marshals every day to protect her life so she, wouldn't be, um, so she wouldn't be killed. And she had to walk through a crowd of angry white adults who were screaming uh, at her and calling her all sorts of racial epithets. But she went to school every single day. Does it begin with Marcus Garvey, who in the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, begins to push this idea of black nationalism and this idea that uh, blacks should have a country as separate to their own. And he founds several civil rights organizations and actually buys old uh, cruise ships to take African Americans from the United States back to Africa as part of the Africa back to Africa movement. Does it begin with Marcus Garvey, who is one of the early advocates for uh, African American civil rights in the United States? Any of those examples, any of those ten, you could make a viable, credible argument. This is when civil rights begins. This is the real beginning of modern civil rights. Ultimately, here's how we're going to determine what marks the beginning of the civil rights movement. This is the criteria for determining historical significance to figure out if something is historically significant and historically important, or is it just an isolated momentary dot in time? So first of all, you have to look at the visibility. Was this something that was uh, seen by the public? Was this uh, uh, publicly available for people at the time to see and that they were aware of. If it's not something that's publicly seen, that's, that, that is um, out in the public and many people um, know about it, then it's probably not that historically significant. If it's just an isolated incident that only people in that area or in that neighborhood would know, then it doesn't fit that criteria. If it's something that everybody knew, then it begins to fit that criteria for historical significance. 
How many people were affected? Was it a wide swath of uh, people? Or is it a very narrow, very focused group of people? Is it only a handful of people that are affected? If it's only a handful of people, if it's only uh, a family, or if it's only a very narrow focused uh, group of people, then it's probably not historically significant. But if it affects a lot of people, a large segment of the population, then again, it begins to meet that criteria for historical significance. You have to look at the number of laws or Supreme Court decisions that were passed that benefited this movement. Were there laws that were passed to advance the, uh, the cause of the, uh, of the movement? Were there Supreme Court decisions that helped push along this, uh, this, this moment in time? How long did it last? It does, have, does this movement have a long lasting effect? Is it something that, that the ripples of that movement are still being felt today? Or is it a, was it a, a movement that only impacted that period of time that really doesn't have a lot of impact still today? So does the movement have a long lasting effect? And finally, is it something that you've heard of or you're aware of? If you're not aware of it or you've never heard of it, then it probably is not historically significant and it was just impactful and was just important at that period of time. But today, it kind of, it, it, it kind of loses a lot of its uh, influence today. So is it something that you've heard of or you're aware of? So these are the criteria that I want you to use as we begin to work through different moments in the civil rights movement and apply these standards to those times, to those moments in the civil rights movement to determine this is when it began. All right, Panthers, good luck.